of our session here today. Joining us are four Saskatchewan artists whose work is showcased in the Art Now Focus booth this year. First, we have Anita Rakamura. Anita has developed Anita has developed as an artist over many years. Her interest in nature and human interactions, along with the shape of natural organic forms, are fundamentals of her work. With often humor thrown in, Anita divides her working practice between one-of-a-kind sculptural vessels and experimental sculptures in clay and mixed media. Her studio, Modern Artifacts, is located in Meacham, Saskatchewan. Welcome, Anita. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Joining us next is Jeffrey Taylor. After discovering pottery and fine arts in high school and subsequently training in, in Red Deer, Alberta, Jeffrey has maintained a production and one-of-a-kind ceramic studio since 1997. Recent explorations have focused and additional and other materials. Uh, oh, sorry, he's actually beginning to now work with other materials other than ceramic. He resides in Crete in a renovated 1928 schoolhouse located in the village of Duval and is joined there by his wife Nadia and scruffy dog Jack. Welcome, Jeffrey. <laughs> Moving on to Danielle Dumoulin, who has recently received a master's in art education with a focus on studio art from the University of Victoria. Danielle is an artist and educator living and working in Regina, Saskatchewan. She's a painter working in both acrylics and oils. Danielle's work focuses on human connection and memory. Welcome, Danielle. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Our final panelist is Shane Juno. Shane is a Saskatchewan stone artist who lives and works in Saskatoon. Finding a prairie field stone is the beginning of the creative process for Shane, after which he intuitively transforms the stone into spontaneous forms that are in harmony with the natural material. Thanks for joining us today, Shane. Hi, good morning or afternoon. <laughs> okay, we're gonna get started. Um, so we can all acknowledge that COVID-19 has affected countless lives around the world in numerous ways. The objective with our time here today is for our panelists to share their experience creating art during this time of isolation and also to examine how their lockdown may have impacted their work permanently. So sheltering in place for three months has affected all of us in different ways. We would like to discover if this has impacted your work in any way and we're going to start off with Jeffrey. Well, thanks. Yeah, well, my work is divided into two spheres of my, I've got my production pottery and then my one of a kind work. And uh, initially when we went into lockdown, uh, I kind of cocooned and did all sorts of things that weren't artistic, um, mostly Netflix. And, uh, but, but after that initial period, my, my focus intensified toward my production work. And I think that was because it was known and predictable and it was something that could just put my head down and, and not really have to think about. Um, and hopefully sort of like squirrel away acorns in pottery form for the future. Um, hopefully when I could sell things again. Uh, but at some point my focus changed and opened up more to the creative as I received some commissions for cremation urns. And there was something that I'd done occasionally before. Um, but the isolating circumstances really drew my thoughts to a broader exploration of what the vessels could encompass both physically and psychologically. Um, so, as you said, I live in a, in a 1928 schoolhouse and it's kind of a lifelong work in progress that I often think of as my master's project of the craft, being a craftsman, it's really, I, I like to pour myself into it. Uh, and I think of it as kind of a reclaimed vessel that contains my story now, as well as all the echoed stories of everyone who sat in its rooms and walked through its doors. Um, and when, when I got it, it was kind of an empty decaying shell and we took it into and make it, it made it into a place of vibrance and beauty, creation uh, and comfort. And I think of it as plump, kind of just, it's saturated with all these memories and stories uh, of people, but without a conversation or a written record, I don't know any of them. Oh, and so now I'm making- such, Well, sorry, that was ahead. great that you had such a, a nice space to um, spend the three months. Oh, in. totally blessed to have this yeah. space. Yeah. Um, so and now they're making- 
urns to hold the physical remains of a person, kind of what was once a structure full of spirit, now it was just the ashes of an empty shell. And I, uh, I, li I like to think, uh, it's, it's kind of pu pushed me into thinking of the different ways that a vessel, the different things that a vessel can hold other than actual, just the, the contents, the, the philosophical and the uh, uh, things that are memories and that sort of stuff. So. That's great. Um, Danielle, I'd like to hear from you. Um, I would say for me, it, it was kind of, it was sort of the same. I started off with this, I, well, before, before COVID hit, I kind of, I had this dream of having this concentrated time to work and, and being able to shut down all my other responsibilities. And then COVID hit and that dream was not nearly as, as productive or as exciting as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> it was a little bit of, I feel like I should be working, but I want to watch Netflix at the beginning. And then I let myself, I just let myself play. I started pulling out projects that um, I had wanted to try that I hadn't started. So one of the things I did is I pulled out some fields that I collected um, and, and different and ground my own pigments. And I made some paintings with my own egg tempras, which was something different than I would normally do because I had the time. And so that like playing with materials was kind of a way to like relax and kind of get myself back into um, being more creative and, or not more creative, but sort of getting back my, my motivation. So I spent a lot of time playing. <laughs> That's great. And Anita, how did it initially um, impact your work? Um, well, it, um, I resisted the idea of COVID uh, because the early part of the year, the, the winter, is always a slower time. It's a time where I invest in crazy ideas and, and make stuff and try things, usually quite, quite joyfully, but I don't need a lot of activity and a lot of social occasions. Unfortunately, my dad passed away in, her, in late January. So it kind of confused my feelings about COVID and all that. And then I sort of just ignored it because it wasn't that different from what I live in the winter, except I couldn't go anywhere. And so I felt stuck. And then I decided, well, a good way to kickstart my brain is to do commissions, which I always have a few on the back burner. So I tried those. Everything turned out horrible. I was trying to be creative and inventive and make new things and kind of go back to all those ideas that get pushed to the back burner when you've got commitments and other work to do and everything was really half-baked and uninspired and it just flopped all over the place, metaphorically and, <laughs> and in actual fact. So. Um, I had an exhibition coming up, so I had to get my butt in gear at one point here, and uh, um, I just said, okay, what's holding me back? And what's holding me back is this COVID. And I was trying to ignore it and say, you know, it's, it's not what I need to, it's, there's nothing I can do for here. I'm just going to ignore it. And I couldn't get anywhere until I faced it head on and created a body of work that was all about COVID and how I'd felt over the last few months and how to represent that, how to identify those things that are taken for granted in normal times and suddenly were taken away and how that felt and, and also feeling great solidarity with like, the great masses who aren't so privileged as we are. You know, we have places of comfort and, and uh, security and many people don't and all those things got played into me. So I really had to just say, okay, I'm gonna look at this and deal with it. That's great. And then the final thought goes to Shane. Yeah, the, uh, the shutdown um, initially, it was, uh, of course, scary. I uh, started watching the news too much, and, uh, and I decided I had to uh, get out of uh, that mode. 
Um, I was lucky enough that my studio is in my backyard, so it's 50 feet away from my back door. So I uh, just hunkered down and spent a lot of time in the studio. Um, and um, some of my piece maybe took on a bit of a, a darker note, but um, still I was able to focus a lot more um, instead of um, having to go to work every day too, so. Oh, that sounds good. Um, now with many limitations in place on our day-to-day -day social interactions, such as restrictions on large gatherings, the number of people in our recommended bubble, has our new normal changed what has inspired any of you? And I think we're gonna start with Danielle on this one. Um, I, I learned from this how much of an extrovert I am. When things shut down, I like, that lack of connection I was actually feeling physically, um, sort of just like con almost almost like I was extremely run down. And as soon as I had any interaction with anybody outside of my household, I could like feel better. Right? And I, um, with that, I with my master's project that I was working on, I started interviewing artists, communities that work together. And even those interactions on Zoom started to like fuel um those that connection so i found i found that um i although i prefer face-to-face -face interactions any mm -hmm. any ability to work with with others um i can still get that that creative drive from those so i it was it was kind of those limitations led to me finding other ways to connect with people and and whether it's social media or this or or celebrating any moment that I have with other people I, I found that it's kind of opened things that way for me which was a surprise for me so and Anita um what inspired you or how were you inspired uh well I don't know if I uh, I, I don't know if I was inspired I, I think I was uh, recognizing some some um, character flaws, maybe, <laughs> for lack of a better way. I'm a person who's happy to be solitary, but the fact that I had to be solitary suddenly really started to, to bug me. And also friends who are intense introverts were knocking at my door all the time because they couldn't take it anymore because it's just too, I need to see somebody, I need to talk to somebody. Uh, so it didn't inspire me in my work, it inspired me in, in my life and how I communicate with people. Um, also found talking on the phone with people after a while became very insufficient. Mm -hmm. And I found it with a lot of people to be that way, insufficient in the sense that you stay in touch with people, you try to keep connected, but there's not very any news. What have you been doing? Oh, nothing. How about you? Well, saying nothing. And, you know, like that connection was not really coming through the wire. And I think in terms of inspiration, since we're talking about art, it takes me a while to, to digest and integrate new uh, events, new information, new, new conditions in life. And I think this will all come out in future work. It's kind of too, aside from this exhibition that was very literal, uh, I think this whole thing is going to come out in later work when I've had a chance to integrate it and, and deal with or feel, feel it. And, and then bring it out. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And Shane, how about you? Uh, yeah, the uh, limitations on, on uh, gatherings um, didn't, I mean, I'm kind of unlike uh, Danielle, I'm much more of an introvert, so uh, I um, didn't, uh, it didn't affect me too much. Uh, uh, it was, you know, uh, difficult to not go out with friends and um, have that social interactions, uh, but um, we certainly made do with uh, when we were able to smaller backyard gatherings. Um, so that was a, a really a bit of a change, but it didn't necessarily change what inspires me. Uh, I uh, 
I still kind of work in my, in my regular way. Um, so uh, it's uh, something that we're all still going through. And uh, mm -hmm. like Anita said, we'll see the repercussions of this here uh, in the future for sure. Yeah, no. And Jeffrey, we'll give you the final comment. Uh, I think I'm still inspired by the same things, but there, there's, I noticed kind of a thread with the Danielle and Anita where you're talking about revisiting old projects and I've got mm -hmm. sculpture supplies piled all over my yard that now are starting to be visited. And uh, yeah, well, like the pieces that I have here, right, digging out one of my old road signs and deciding what to do with it. Um, and it's going to take me a lot of years to do that. So uh, I, I think I, I get inspired by each, each piece of material differently. And, and now I'm really looking for what it could contain more than just what I would make out of it, if that makes sense. Um, I think there's, uh, well, I, my, my, my stockpiles are kind of chaos and I'm really looking to, to bring order to that, but also not, not just order in the sense of, measurements on a ruler but some sort of meeting as well that's understandable i think so um yeah well despite all the craziness around us how do all of you as artists um keep your creativity flowing anita we're gonna begin with you <laughs> didn't i just finish saying that the creativity wasn't flowing exactly <laughs> uh, like a big torrent but it's pretty hard not to be creative. I mean, the life we chose, the life that was chosen for us really is based on the fact that we're creating. We've got something mm -hmm. we're compelled to, to do, whether it's making it with our hands or writing it down or talking, painting it. Those things are there, we can't, you know. But we do, um, uh, we do reflect what is going on around us. So the creativity mm -hmm. is going to be muted or on fire, depending on like personal life, personal conditions, and also um, having deadlines. Having deadlines is a great igniter of creativity for me. <laughs> and there are no deadlines. I don't have a market, I don't have an exhibition, I don't have too much, you know, like, so I don't really feel like making a bunch of stuff because where is it gonna go? And then by the time it goes somewhere, I'll be bored with it and I'll be onto something else. So in that sense, you know, I'm kind of flighty that way, okay? It's made, it's done, it goes, I love you, but now I'm just eating another batch of puppies, so to speak, you know? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, you know, how, how do you keep your creativity flowing? Uh, I, I like what the, uh, Anita had, had said there as well. Um, but uh, my, um, my works, they, they take me a while to complete. I, I work on them um, quite slowly. Sometimes I'll, I'll work on a piece for a month or two, uh, although I'm working on multiple pieces at the same time. Um, but it allowed me to... Um, pick up some older pieces that I had started uh, a year or two ago and actually finished them, uh, which was uh, nice to get some of that stuff finished off. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it hasn't, uh, ha has changed, but uh, not in a negative way, I'd have to say. The, uh, the deadlines uh, had a few shows, group shows that were canceled. Um, mm -hmm. One which I was really looking forward to was a sculpture symposium at, um, in Manitou. And uh, that was uh, canceled, unfortunately, um, during the summertime. Uh, so that, uh, that was, uh, uh, we'll have to pick up, I guess, uh, next year, I hope so. Jeffrey, how do you keep your creativity flowing? Well, it, it's always kind of ebbed and flowed seasonally, different things, whether that's seasonal affective disorder or not, I don't know. Um, probably a little bit of that. Um, and generally, generally, I'm looking at lots of external media for, for different things, whether that's uh, videos or podcasts, audio books. Um, I like to play and write music, uh, journaling, prayer and meditation, um, connecting with uh, some of the members of the art collectives that I'm, I'm involved with uh, and looking at lots of art, I guess that freed me up with a lot of time for, for doing those things. Um, but I agree with what Anita was saying about that, the phone calls, right? They just don't do the same thing as a face-to-face. 
so that's hard. Um, I kind of run the middle between introvert and extrovert, so I can, I can take or leave people depending on the season. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely started missing people, but also didn't, didn't miss lots of my extra commitments that maybe I shouldn't have said yes to in, in the first place and maybe not looking forward to them coming back online now as, as things open up or they, some of them have and some and more are still coming, but, um, uh, one of the most fun things I did to keep my creativity going was I bought myself a, an Apple pencil so I can draw on my iPad properly. It's amazing. So it was a lot of fun. But. That's really cool. Uh, Danielle, how about you? Um, oh, so a lot of what everyone has said already, but um, I definitely, I, I tried to create some deadlines for myself because I agree with Anita. Deadlines can be the best motivator sometimes. Um, I also, and, and as I mentioned before, trying different projects that I had kind of let go, but I also picked up, like, I, I started playing the violin again after like a lot of years, much to my family's pain. Um, or or um, I started playing video games, which I've never played before, and, and that was really fun. And so letting myself just kind of do other things, I felt, I felt when I did go back to sitting down and sort of my scheduled time that I had for art making, I, it, it was a good like way to step away from the art so there wasn't as much pressure because I think you need that, that time where you're collecting information from the world around you. And when we were shut in our houses for so long, it was hard to find that external stimulation for myself. So, so giving myself things like the violin or video games or Netflix. I, I after a while didn't feel bad about it because I thought it was just a way to let my brain collect information. So <laughs> that's so interesting. Well, that kind of is a little bit of a bridge into our next question. Um, has living with COVID prompted any of you to use any new digital platforms that you hadn't been using in the past? But I think we can make this question a little bit bigger. Have you guys tried anything new um, as a result of COVID? And we'll start with Shane. Uh, I, uh, I definitely, I mean, things like uh, Zoom calls, like we're on right now, um, didn't really use that much uh, before COVID. Uh, I also found that um, keeping in touch with friends, uh, I used to text quite a bit. Um, and there's really no connection in text because they're just short little segments of thoughts. Uh, and uh, started using um, FaceTiming and Zoom calls and even just talking on the phone a lot more. Uh, just to hear somebody's voice as opposed to texting, texting back and forth. Um, and I really actually quite miss that uh, connection um, when someone is in a different province. Um, so yes, indeed, I've started using a lot more uh, media, um, whether that's good or bad. Not too sure yet. <laughs> and Jeffrey. Well, I, I want to comment on what Shane there said there, because I was thinking about Anita's and my reactions about phone calls, and I'm not uh, necessarily asking people's ages, but when your immediate thing is, I, I stopped texting as much and started phoning people, I thought, oh, that's an interesting upgrade where we're, we're longing for the, yeah, it's kind of the these, these scaling of, of our communication means. Um, what did I do digitally? Um, I didn't, I didn't do a ton of things new. I think that, that Apple Pencil was new. Mm -hmm. um, I started looking at Again, old projects I've been thinking about. I, I've been using uh, 3D printing for my production pottery work to make stamps and that sort of thing. And so I started about thinking about how to take that process into my one of a kind artworks. And so hopefully have some new pieces coming out with some uh, 3D printed additions and uh, parts to them. Um, updated my website, which was atrocious for years and finally put an online store into it and, and everything and had professional help doing that. So that was a, that was a real big uh, change, I think. And that unfortunately also added a whole lot of work because now I have to keep the stock updated on there. So that's yeah. interesting. And then probably the, the other big thing was I've, I've used Adobe's uh, Creative Suite for a lot of years for different drawing and, and purposes, but I used it, to, especially for this piece that's in the show, uh, to actually design the parts and uh, figure out how that was gonna all go, go together, so. That was a new use of that tool for me. Okay, and Anita, how about you? <laughs> I, have a real I can see you giggling there. 
Uh, because I've learned nothing. Well, I learned to do this. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll be more employable in the future should I decide to have a real job. But in the meantime, no, I've done more writing, more um, more reading, which is my my... My, my biggest addiction is reading and writing, aside from play. Uh, I learned to play solitaire on the computer. Woo! And, and I really got way, um, uh, uh, very unhealthily addicted to what I now call my dose of stupid, like watching the news on a computer every day, you know? What have those little efforts done now that... <laughs> <laughs> that's not healthy and it doesn't feed anything in me it just makes that that little knot in the pit of my stomach uh, get tighter and because I worry I worry about everybody and everything you know from the butterflies to the to my next door neighbor to the trees in the yard and yeah. but in terms of like digital no no. Well, you here you are, so I think you're, you're fine. <laughs> and oh. Danielle, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, digital is something that, like, I, I sort of, I like to play with sometimes, but it's sort of like it's not. It does it. It doesn't threaten me, but it's also not like a passion of mine. So, so I mean, I did. I revamped my website it actually looks like it's usable and um i discovered how much you can do with powerpoint over this like it's a way better program than i ever gave it credit for but but for the most part i mean i did i did use it really to connect there was a lot of like um i, I did have some deeper texting conversations with friends than before texting would usually be more like see you in 15 minutes right whereas we, i had some texting conversations which was kind of fun and connections and um i also made really good use to a lot of the free dance classes that were on instagram live at the beginning of <laughs> COVID. Yeah. but yeah yeah and zoom zoom has become or video chats has become a pretty normal thing now so where i was actually i was saying to the panelists before we started when i bought my computer in the fall it has a camera in the keyboard and I went, that doesn't matter. I've never used the camera in my computer ever. What will I ever use this? And now I use it regularly. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's about it. Could I add okay. something to this? Sure. Um, I know digital platforms and communication are really useful and wonderful art is made via the digital media. But it's not my thing. And I think the kind of skills that I have and others like me have are really what we need to concentrate on and, and leave the other media forms to people who are more suited to it. You know, there's no interface between my brain and my hands. It all works together. And that's like the most sophisticated uh, interface you can find ever. And, I think that we water down our abilities if we if we start to throw our time and our energy into promoting the work instead of making the work. That's I totally agree with you. Actually, I've read a lot um, about different trends going on, and that it's moving to more handcrafted and hands-on um, pieces that people are are um, craving. And can people I, make just... wonderful work with with, uh, with digital media. But mm -hmm. Danielle? Well, I, I, I just want to add to that because I absolutely agree. Like there was many times there, well, and not just over COVID, I would say in general, where it wouldn't be if we have, like, if, if during COVID the internet had shut down for a few months, I think I would have really enjoyed that. Like it's, <laughs> it sometimes becomes this this external pressure right whereas like mm -hmm. i found i was working i would go into my little studio office and sit at the computer for 12 hours because work never stopped right and mm -hmm. that like i do agree that sometimes i think digital in certain ways can 
be a, like a negative impact to work. Definitely. Um, so unless you share a studio space, the hours an artist spends creating are often in solitude. Did the lockdown force you to change anything in your processes for food? Um, Jeffrey. Oh, and you ask me because you know my studio is in my house. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, I think about that a lot, actually, about uh, my processes and actually where I make them and, and whether having a separate studio would, would affect that. Um, there's, there's no separation between my life and, and my work. Like there's, we, we live and work. My studio is separated by a door and it's in, it's in another building that was added on in the 50s. So it's, it's part, it's integral to the school. And then our gallery space is actually it kind of spiders into our whole house. So there's, there's mm -hmm. this blurred zone. And especially when we do our open houses, it, almost everything except for our bedroom is free game for people to wander around in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so not having those clear lines of where anything stopped and home began was, was interesting. And then COVID just shut all that off. And so all it was, was I, I, I couldn't get out of that even. So I was, I was in that space that was my whole life. Um, so did that change my processes? Um, probably the biggest thing when we, when we do our open houses, we usually would, would open up and we can get up to 400 people coming through on a, on a single day. And uh, we had to change that now. And so we, we borrowed, well, traded pottery for a 20 by 40 foot tent and uh, moved everything outside and extended it to two days. Hopefully that would uh, enable people to socially distance. And it was phenomenal, the response people Thought it was the best thing we'd ever done and we sold way way more than we ever expected and yeah it was so in, in that way I, I really feel like god blessed us with covid in some ways right where people were eager to shop by that point like it was mm -hmm. the middle of the summer and they had nothing to do um That's yeah amazing. so i don't think we did we've done that we wouldn't uh, then be planning to do the same thing next year and yeah who knows where it's going to go from there so. That's cool um danielle how about you I don't any more than what I've already said. I mean, my studio is outside of my home, and it's in a in a space where I, because I'm an extrovert, where I can interact with people. So I moved into a smaller space in my home, and so having that cut off from people was probably the biggest thing for me. But okay, that's and Anita. Well, my studio is a separate building. It's about half a block from my house, and. I have uh, cats there and plants and I have to go every day, twice a day, whether I'm working or not. And once I'm there, there's always something to do. You know, it's like another life. It's like somebody who has two families. I have a family here. I have a family there that I need to look at. And, and I have virtually no work of mine at home. But at the studio, you know, like every shelf has some reject or other or work in progress or something waiting to go somewhere. And I need that. I need to do, to see the work and also all the little knickknacks in my studio that that wouldn't work here in, at home, but at, that I need that are part of my visual landscape, my peripheral vision that kind of, it's familiar, but it also feeds me on a regular basis. So I love having, a, I've had studios in closets, in kitchen, in my kitchen over the, the day. I've been doing this for a very long time. So mm -hmm. having a nice big studio that I practically rebuilt from scratch, and that's where I go to be with myself and my three cats. <laughs> <laughs> Shane, how about you? Has any of your any of your processes changed during the lockdown? When I um, am working on my stones, I, I create a, a lot of dust and a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, work in solitude um, all the time. And uh, this uh, and COVID has pretty much just allowed me to you know transition through that without much change. Uh, I'm usually working in um, full PPE, so respirator, uh, ear, you know, uh, ear protection. So I usually just have my uh, earbuds in and um, 
work in solitude and, and zone out uh, while I'm working and it hasn't changed one little bit, uh, especially my studio being so close, uh, just in my backyard. So uh, not at all. Okay. Well, now it's like super exciting for me. We're going to get um, each of you to describe the inspiration behind the piece that you have in the focus booth. Um, we're going to begin with, um, if we could have Anita's image brought up, and we'll get Anita to speak to her piece. <clears throat> There's a green screen, but no picture in it. <laughs> it's a minimalist work. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, these are a couple of um, uh, pieces. Okay, one is quarantine and the other one is good things. But, um, uh, so I'll start with good things. These pieces are actually supposed to be farther apart and the, the strings between the two pieces is supposed to be taut, uh, tight. So in this piece I was talking about the telephone communication that we had how we kept each other uh, afloat, essentially. So all of these little squares on the red things are words. And there's words on both sides because sometimes things mean different, have different meaning, and some positive, some negative. And that's part of exchanging um, comfort and distress, sharing comfort and distress with uh, with our dear one, with each other, even with strangers on the street. Um, so that's what this one is. So it goes from one head to another, through the mouth, into the ear. And those are messages, conversations. Uh, the other piece, which is called Quarantine, is much more literal. Uh, it felt to me that we were becoming hermit crabs in a way where we lived our lives into our own space. And that's why it's, it's like somebody's face and head, but it has the roof of a house on it. And the windows are shattered, the door is barricaded. And in a way that's, that's what uh, COVID seemed to embody for me in a very kind of literal way because we became, it's not just a bubble, it's like we became our own house, our own living abode, which, I mean, when I think about it, it's not that different from any other time, but it became more obvious during COVID that we had to keep our distance and be self-contained and self-sufficient. So in a way, both of these pieces are uh, opposite to each other. Keep distance, but communicate. Uh, barricade yourself in your own little world. You know, keep, a, keep an eye out here and there for what might be happening. But there's two facets of all the many different things I felt and dealt with. Oh, wow, thank you so much. Um, next, we're going to um, going to go to Jeffrey to look at his piece. Well, I'm just going to kind of revisit my artist statement that's on the, the website. It's, uh, uh, this piece basically came out of commissions for urns, and and one one particular one that uh, the couple came to me and would like they wanted an urn that was large enough to, for both of them, and I needed at that point to make to reassure myself that they weren't planning anything uh, <laughs> and and they weren't they'd just been inspired by seeing another urn that i had made and, and really thought that would be a, a nice statement for them as, as a couple um so and through through that and other conversations it really started to uh, have me think about these these vessels and what they could contain um and I started to comp contemplate the different departure routes that we, we would take as people, uh, different ways that we leave the world, or different ways that we leave uh, different endeavors or things. And so I, I've got other pieces now that I'm working on that uh, explore the death of a business and the death of um, a different sort of con conceptual things. 
um, this one here was exploring kind of the thought of, of people who who die on the highways and uh, the fact that I'm using a road sign which was originally purposed to indicate that there's safety and it's turned into a vessel to carry uh, someone who's part of a tragic loss for lack of safety on the road. Um, yeah, and sort of sort of had me thinking and resonating inside about my own actions and activities and things that had happened to me in COVID, um, just mental health wise even, that I, I perceived as safe and now they were implicated toward possible roots of my demise. And uh, they really caused me to evaluate lots of cultural and personal road signs that I got. So that's kind of both that piece. Wow. Um, okay, we're going to look at Danielle's piece. Okay. So um, mine, I actually started before quarantine. Well, I started it before quarantine actually yeah. locked down. It was sort of as COVID was creeping towards us. Um, it reminded me of, of a time that... Um, this image is actually of myself and my teaching partner when we did a zombie unit with our students to learn about pandemics. And at that time I was reading a, a novel by Charles Todd and in the novel, this, um, it was the first world war. And so they were, were dealing with the flu pandemic of the first world war. And one of the characters said, well, this is 1918. We don't have pandemics. That's something from the middle ages. And I sort of, <laughs> that that quote kind of resonated with me because as as covid was coming towards us people would be like yeah but we're in saskatchewan we're not going to have the pandemic in saskatchewan right mm -hmm. and so um this piece is really sort of that that like how when it first then when, when you know school shut down and businesses shut down and we went into our homes it was it felt like one of those many zombie movies that i like spent all my time watching when I was younger so it and then and then it was I mean it's our it's our version but pandemics do happen and have happened throughout history and so we're in it right now but it's not going to last forever too like they always whether there's a vaccine or they just burn themselves out we will return to a different normal but a normal that is not this <laughs> so oh. that's that's that piece that's so positive I love it um, Shane, we're going to take a look at your piece now. Uh, so um, this originally started out as um, not a not a cycle pump uh, figure, but just two figures uh, in an embrace. Um, but as the so I started it before kind of COVID lockdown, um, and as uh, COVID uh, kind of took hold, um, I started kind of seeing you know I guess darker images in you know media and. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned into um, cycle pomp. So it's a uh, Greek mythology uh, takes the souls of the uh, recently departed <clears throat> to the afterlife and just see a lot of uh, focus on, on death uh, in the news. Um, and it made its way in, into the piece as well. Um, so it's a, a hooded figure, kind of like a Grim Reaper type figure, uh, kind of making a shadowy form of a uh, uh, more of a smaller adolescent type uh, uh, to the afterlife, I guess. Um, so it's, it was, uh, didn't start out as, as dark as it ended up, um, but as I work a piece, it kind of, I see different uh, forms and shapes and that's how it ended up. Well, oh, thank you so much. Um, so we might have touched on some of this already, but what were some of the highest and lowest points you experienced during the three months of the lockdown? Um, Danielle, we're gonna begin with you. Highest and lowest point. Um, <laughs> the lowest point was probably at like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning when I was sitting up and I couldn't sleep and I could hear hollers and trains and all these sounds out in the neighborhood and I knew I wasn't the only one that was awake and um and I just it felt I it felt very much like that was going to be something that uh was never going to end and then for me the highest point would be um 
when I actually started conducting interviews with other artists and started talking to them and, and kind of just having that connection with other people that were also living it. And, and I, I felt really motivated from that moment. So that was for me. Yeah. That's cool. How about you, Anita? Well, having had some personal uh, grief to deal yeah. with, um, it all kind of got mixed up. And mm -hmm. in terms of work and creativity, my lowest point was, was when I was trying to make work that completely ignored the COVID uh, issue. And I kept hitting my head against the wall. I, I tried everything, every little trick I've accumulated and everything fell flat. And when I finally confronted the whole thing, it just flew and, and that it became like a, a high point because I wasn't fighting something, I was well, not exactly embracing it, but you know, acknowledging it in the only way I really know that it's significant to me, which is through work. So that was the high point when I stopped pretending that I can I can live and create as I always did and let that stuff be outside of my experience and that didn't work. So that was a low point. And when I embraced it and worked on it, that became a high point. I kind of exercised all of those worries and, and observations and lack of contact that, that, that you know, made everybody, makes everybody unhappy. Well, thank you. Um, Shane, how about you? And uh, I guess uh, being able to uh, focus on um, working on artwork uh, for myself was uh, having the, uh, the time to, to uh, spend time in the studio uh, mm -hmm. without other distractions was uh, certainly a, a, a high point for the art. Uh, that I create, but uh, also um, reaching out to uh, friends and family, kind of trying to get a, a having a, a deeper connection because we weren't having those face-to-face uh, -face conversations anymore um, mm -hmm. was uh, certainly good to, to reach out people to people who I haven't maybe had you know close connections with or as close as I wanted to, um, but the COVID uh, the lockdown kind of forced me to to do that to, to reach out to my friends and families and. Uh, have those, like I was saying, more kind of in-depth phone conversations or um, Zoom calls, as opposed to uh, sending a, a, you know, a casual text back and forth. So, um, and low points, I mean, like myself, I'll, you know, will suffer with some depression at some points, and I just had to make sure I had myself busy and uh, make sure that didn't uh, creep in again, so. Thank you so much, Shane. And Jeffrey, we're going to give you the final comment. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I, I had a pretty low point uh, <laughs> where I was on the verge of a mental breakdown. Um, mm -hmm. Never been in a place like that before. And it was really interesting because it was one of those things, and I don't know if anybody else has on the panel's experiences, where you were in the middle of something and you sort of removed from yourself and you're watching it happen to you and you're wondering, how do I stop this? How do I stop this slide? And fortunately, I was able to, to, to look at it and not go too far into it. But it was, it was a pretty scary moment to, to think about uh, as I was dwelling on the fact that is my business going to survive? Is my artistic practice going to look anything like it looked like before? What happens? Um, but yeah, my, through, through, through my wife's support and my community of faith that's around me, that, that really, really helped out. And just, just being able... And I think that also brought a positive out in the fact that I know I can recognize that in myself now and that I reached out and took steps to change it, right? Rather than just internalizing it and, and sinking deeper. Um, so, so that was rather fortunate. Um, pro probably the, one of the best things, well, there was a couple of really good things. During, during this time, I sold uh, one of my favorite sculptures to a, uh, a wonderful collector. So that was really good. And then I also, uh, my, my wife and I adopted a dog. And uh, I think that's been really part good for that mental health aspect as well. Uh, because it got me out exercising and uh, yeah, it was really good. 
Um, the other low point was I got really, really sick during that time as well and actually got tested for COVID, uh, but was negative, so. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, so I guess this is our thing slightly. Sure. Just like a second. Oh no. I think no the problem. biggest shock, and I, I don't think I only speak for myself in this, is that we work hard mm -hmm. and we have a measure of control over our life. And this was completely out of our control. And that was hard to come to terms with, I find, mm -hmm. because it affected personally, creatively, uh, family, friends, the kind of support system we have. All of that was impacted and continues to be. I think that we all have our little bubble of, of friends uh, that we talk with, but we have no control over this thing, no matter what we do. We don't have the control and the security that, that we as Western, in the, Westerners in an affluent nation usually have. And this is like, why is this happening to us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeffrey? Well, I just thought, so it's interesting hearing you say that because I, I agree totally. Um, and then it, it ha it's having me reflect on one of your early comments, Anita, where you talked about at the start, you started doing commissions, which for me is like, I, I don't like them because I don't have the control necessarily. So in your, in your commission work, do you, do you still maintain the majority of the control over that or? Well, I, I always tell people, I don't want money up front. Yes. Then I feel really guilty and I feel I have to. Um, I, I always say, and I'll make something like this, you know, in this area of interest. But if you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. That's my safety mm -hmm. net in terms of, uh, uh, but what I find positive about commissions is that I already have a track, a set track. So it helps to push the train along. And I don't, I don't take a lot of commissions. I'm very selective. I used to because that's what you learned is part of the business, right? Mm -hmm. It's always part of what you have to do. But people would wait like 10 years for something, you know? Mm -hmm. And then as time goes by, I feel less and less like making it because I'm not doing that anymore. You know, it becomes a vicious circle. So. Now the kind of commissions will be like funeral urns, mm -hmm. um, uh, people who broke things that they once had that they loved, or do some stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, those are the kind of commissions. Or commissions from people I know well, collectors that have supported me for many decades. That's different because they know, they know me, and yeah. that's all. And it's a, the, the good part about it is just a starting point. I don't have to think too hard. It'll, it's already kind of designed for me in, in a general way. So that's what I mean about kickstarting. It's like putting the car on a hill going down and then you build up speed. <laughs> I don't see it out, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess the final question we were going to discuss today is um, how is this time spent in lockdown? Has it had any really long-term effects on your work or your, has it changed you personally? Uh, Shane. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, um, the lockdown has certainly forced me to, um, like we discussed before, uh, explore the, uh, more the digital uh, aspects of, of our world. Um, like, uh, Zoom calls, which I'll be, you know, probably, you know, still using after the lockdown. Uh, definitely a good way to connect with people. Um, working on uh, websites, actually having the time to uh, get my website uh, up and running. Uh, that was uh, certainly a good impact for me. But in the long run, um, as for uh, a pathway that my art is going to take, um, I think Anita touched on it earlier, saying, well, we don't know what the repercussions are going to be uh, from of this pandemic and how long this pandemic is going to last. Uh, so um, I think time will tell how it uh, uh, will affect um, everyone's uh, art and uh, how we view art as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jeffrey, how about you? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I can answer it for the creative 
content of my work. And yeah, I really feel like, like this is still pretty short term. So to understand it is, is, is hard at this point. Um, but I'd hope that as any world changing event does, it sends ripples through all of aspects of my life and, and affects them. And probably one of the things, and it's more the business side of my work is, is I'm really endeavoring right now to become 100% debt free and have savings. So I don't have to have any expectation or reliance on, on government funding or anything like that as an artist. And uh, it's, it's going to be a difficult road ahead, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that day. So that's. Um, Danielle, how about you? I, I don't, I don't know at this point. I, I feel I'm still too in the middle of it. What I think, um, yeah, I think that might be a question I can answer maybe in five years. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I did, I've, I've thought lots about it, but I, I really, I am, um, at this point, I don't know. It's too happening. So. Yeah, no, that's totally understandable. I think I feel like when we wrote these questions, it was a long time ago, but really it still seems like nothing's really changed. Yeah. In our mindset. Uh, how about you, Anita? Well, I agree with Danielle in the sense that it's too soon to tell because mm -hmm. we don't have a perspective. We, we haven't done a, a kind of an accounting in a way of, mm -hmm. of the, the costs and benefits. Um, yeah. I think what, what, sh what is changing and may continue to change is how we interact with the uh, art public. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably going to be the, the most significant in the immediate, uh, as we see, because we're doing this now, there's, uh, there's already changes. Um, I think uh, artists can develop a relationship with their customers, with their collectors, with the, their buyers and um, probably expose themselves to broader markets. It's not, I mean, I'm saying this for the benefit of other artists, especially the ones starting out. Um, for me, it's too late. <laughs> but uh, in terms of how it will change things, I don't know. What I hope mm -hmm. is that because there's so many uh, extreme changes socially, politically, that are uh, happening at this time that have been caused by the epidemic, mm -hmm. uh, that the changes are going to be touching every aspect of our life, not just our life as artists. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what we do is probably a good, a good medication, a good medicine for what ails us as a society, you know, and, and as a planet. So we got to keep doing it as best as we can. And, you know, artists have never had an easy time of it. We're always kind of going against the grain, you know, swimming up the current. And um, so it's not like a big change in the big scheme of things, you know. We just respond, we react, we to follow our little path and hope that we can have enough money when we kick the bucket to buy a basket <laughs> or an urn from Jeffrey. Buy one of Jeffrey's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, that was kind of more of it, but no. <laughs> no it's perfectly fine. <laughs> um, so we have some time if any of our participants would like to ask any questions. Do we hear them? Oh. Hang on. Maybe this helps. Okay. Thanks, Belinda. <laughs> I didn't um, hear any of that. <laughs> well, um, we're going to end it there, I guess. And um, it has really been such an interesting discussion. You know, I'm totally grateful. I see a question there. Oh, do yeah. you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's from Belinda Hill. She says, I'm wondering if the political upheaval affected you. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Who would like to um, 
and take that question. Uh, well, anybody else? <laughs> I would say it's, it's, it's hard not to be affected by the political upheaval mm -hmm. because we generally are pretty in tune with our environment and our, and our social groups and the, the broader social groups and political upheaval of the kind that is happening now and you know whether it's migration or mm -hmm. nascent fascism or uh, the fact that large numbers of people don't have the basic the basics of life the fact that uh, planets on fire all of those things are really important to artists and human beings, and we're human beings. So political upheaval in the way that it affects the society we live in and the society we try to contribute to is a real, um, it's a worry. It's a knot in the pit of your stomach. It's a, a, an incentive to do and be better. And that usually reflects in the work. I, I had a really neat uh, recent one. I wasn't sure whether I was going to share it or not. Um, and it, it's more of our, our really local uh, political upheaval. So uh, recently I've been uh, reading all I could about the uh, walking with our angels uh, ceremony that was at the uh, legislature with Tristan Grosher. And as I'm going through the articles, I see the picture that they have with the Leader Post article that he's holding one of my mugs. And one of the things I do that as a, as a, as a ritual that I do uh, is I pray over the, the pots that I make and just pray that, that there'll be a blessing to people and that they'll be used in transformative ways. And that just, it just stunned me that the, my work could be part of that really, really important work that he was doing. Um, and I've had a few different uh, things happen where people have used my work in different ways, whether it's recovering alcoholics using teapots to create new ceremonies and stuff. And so that was, that was a positive way that the political upheavals affected me. And so it even had me stepping out of my comfort zone, which is pretty close to home and going and visiting the site and talking to people and, and spending some time there. So it was, yeah. No, I just. I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and read um, Belinda's comment there. I noticed that too. I love, he's always had handmade mugs. Mm -hmm. His mass protest was very impactful to me as well, yeah. So great to see all of you and share your work and inspiration. Well done. That is an amazing story, Jeffrey. Yeah. It's very cool. Are there any other questions from the audience or comments that the panelists would like to make? Okay, well, I am. I just wanted to say that I'm really grateful for the time all of you have taken to um, discuss your experience and share the artwork that was born out of it. Um, I'd like to thank you, um, Danielle Doomley of the Arts Wood Space in Regina, Anita Rockamora of the Hanway Gallery in Meacham, Jeffrey Taylor of the Lobby Gallery in Regina, and Shane Junock of the Saskatchewan Craft Council in Saskatoon. And I would encourage everyone who's with us today to visit the Art Now Focus booth online until September 27th. And there's actually a ton more programming um, coming your way with Art Now. You can visit it, um, artnow.ca slash online slash online dash event to check everything else out. Thanks everybody for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.